Good morning. I have to say I'm a little disappointed. I was hoping to walk out here to the dulcet tones of Kermit the Frog, given the theme of today's meeting. But hopefully, hopefully it'll become obvious to you today that the topic of my talk is really something that cuts across, if you like, the entire theme of today's uh, celebration of ideas, really. Um, I believe as a scientist that the most important questions that we can ask are very basic questions such as who we are as a species and where do we come from? What are the things that distinguish us from other life and of course what are the things that unite us with other living creatures on the planet? And our beginning, our evolution, really marks one of the most important events in the history of the planet, the history of the Earth, and probably also the history of the universe. And really at the centre of these sorts of questions are issues, questions, problems, complex phenomena like human consciousness. The 20th century luminary of evolutionary biology, uh, Julian Huxley, was actually believed that uh, the arrival of humans, our evolution, was such a profound event in the Earth's history that he thought that the geological period when it occurred should have its own name. He dubbed it the Psychozoic Era which means literally the era of the mind or soul, and of course, not to be confused with the Anthropocene. And contemporary cosmologists like Paul Davies, for example, have argued that our evolution, in fact, marks the arrival of universal self-awareness. In other words, the universe itself becoming conscious or self-aware. And I guess for as long as people have been reflecting on these sorts of questions, We've been aware of this seeming gulf between us and the rest of life, the rest of uh, life on Earth. And we've really developed these rather complex cosmologies like this Ptolemaic one where we've placed the Earth, our earthly home, at the centre of the universe, the centre of the cosmos. Proof positive, if you like, of our, of our special place in the universe. But of course, as science does, science overturned this. Copernicus, in fact, turned this on its head and showed that, in fact, the sun was the centre of the universe, well, at least the solar system more accurately. And that, of course, that our earthly home, our evolutionary home, was re merely one of a number of celestial or extraterrestrial bodies that orbits the sun. And, of course, 400 years later, another profound, another consciousness-shifting consciousness -shifting event occurred, of course, with the space race and the Apollo missions. We set foot for the first time on our extraterrestrial neighbour, the moon. And of course, this did a number of things to us. Firstly, it made us acutely aware of the fact that we are, seem to be alone in the universe. And of course, this inspired the present day search for life on other planets, life on other parts of the universe, perhaps even intelligent life. But it also made us realise how probably insignificant our place was. Our earthly home, a pale blue dot against the vast expanse of the black universe. For me, more than any other image from this time, this one really captures, I think, the poignancy, the significance of a moment like this for us as an event in our history. Uh, a seemingly ordinary image of a footprint, but in fact a footprint made by a biped, a two-footed ape, one of us, on our extraterrestrial neighbour, the moon. And of course the poignancy of a moment like this, but also the, the depth of culture and technology and science human innovation that underpins our capacity to capture an image like this, a moment like this. And of course, exploration is something that we do as humans. It's at the core of who we are as our species. We see it in our ancestors. And of course, it's at the core of this enterprise that we call, that I know very well, science. Um, we explore, sometimes just for the sake of exploring, whether that's a uh, exploring the imagination, exploring an internal world, a thought experiment, or of course exploring the external world to us. Sometimes worlds we can see, sometimes worlds that we can't. And there's something rather inspiring about this search for life on other planets, but something ironic as well. And for me the irony is that we're so quick, of course, to look to extraterrestrial places to find evidence for other life, hopefully intelligent life. When in fact it wasn't that long ago that on our very own planet that there was other intelligent life, that we shared our planet with other highly intelligent creatures. And I don't mean aliens, I'm not talking about some extinct extraterrestrial civilization. I'm talking about our evolutionary relatives. 
And these were highly intelligent two-footed apes, a lot like us. Some of them even had culture, as we do. But yet, of course, we find ourselves in this very unusual situation today, where we're alone. But it hasn't always been like that. In fact, for the seven or eight million years that our ancestors evolved, their world was filled with other intelligent two-footed creatures. The, the environment, they shared their environment with them. And in fact, today really is the unusual situation. And undoubtedly, you've heard of some of our cousins, the Neanderthals. And of course, I don't mean the front row forwards on your local rugby team. <laughs> I mean our, our cousin, our evolutionary cousin, Homo neanderthalensis, if you want the technical name. And they were around until about 40,000 years ago. The so-called hobbit, or Homo floresiensis, that lived on the island of Flores in Indonesia, that died about 17,000 years ago. And my own work, my own discovery with my colleague Ji Shui Ping, in southwest China, the Red Deer Cave people, who were alive, cousins alive until about 10,000 years ago. And if we put that into context, 10,000 years ago was at the time that people are inventing agriculture. They're clearing the land, growing their food, domesticating plants, livestock, and really setting things up for the sort of lifestyle that we have today, the urbanised lifestyle, really starts to begin with farming. When we look at our species, Homo sapiens, of the wise person, so named by Carl Linnaeus, because of our consciousness, we are only about 200,000 years young as a species. Probably the most recent, the last species to emerge in this vast tree of diversity that we think of as our evolutionary cousins, the two-footed apes. And, of course, if we're interested in consciousness, we must be interested in signs or evidence for behaviour. And the evidence for behaviour comes from the archaeological record. And when we look at the archaeological record for that 200,000 year period, we can scarcely distinguish the behaviour of our ancestors from our close relatives like the Neanderthals. That is, until about 50, 60, maybe at a pinch, 70,000 years ago. About three quarters of the way through our evolution as a species. And archaeologists have dubbed this the human revolution. So say it occurred about three quarters of the way through the evolution of our species. And this may well be the time when we see Davies's universal self-awareness emerge. It may be Huxley's psychozoic. It's not with the appearance of humans, but three quarters of the way through. The evolution, the appearance of the human mind. And what do we see? We see things like this. Shell beads that would have been strung and worn as a necklace. Jewelry the very first jewellery. Our ancestors started to settle new parts of Africa and got out of Africa. So for the first time, our species settled other parts of the planet. And our ancestors began to live in new environments. Up until this time, we don't have any idea or any evidence for any of our ancestors living in really quite challenging environments like rainforests, dry arid areas, including deserts, high mountain ranges, high altitude areas, and very quickly also our ancestors settled the Arctic about this time, about 40, 50,000 years ago. And our ancestors, members of Homo sapiens, settled East Asia, Australasia and Australia all about this time, new and unfamiliar places, challenging environments. And of course our ancestors started to make glorious things like this we see the beginnings of art. I mean, this more than anything else really represents the human mind, human consciousness. The use of symbolism, representing the internal or the external world with something symbolic. Uh, in this case, magnificently intricate, beautiful paintings on the walls of caves and rock shelters made all about the same time in Australia, Asia and Europe, around 40 or so thousand years ago. And we also see this remarkable technological flourishing at this time, remarkable innovation. Our ancestors had, by and large, used fairly large and chunky tools until this time. And then we begin to see things like these delicate tools that we call microliths. Things that you might, for example, glue or bind onto a spear to make a harpoon. Perhaps the beginning, the Stone Age precursors of the iPad or the iPhone. So what happened? Why at this time? Why wasn't it 200,000 years ago? Why didn't Huxley's psychozoic arrive when our species arrived? Why was it 
three quarters of the way through our evolution as a species that we see the emergence of the human mind. And of course, this is an amazing conundrum for us at the moment in science. And I'm not going to pretend I have the answers, but there is some very fascinating evidence that we can build to develop a scenario, to develop a narrative, and it's a rather surprising one. So at this time, about 60,000 years ago, as our ancestors began to move into these new areas of Africa and to spread out of Africa, the world was a very different place. In fact, it was filled with our close relatives, a mystery species in Africa um, who we know from their DNA, but we don't know from the fossil record. The Neanderthals living in the Middle East and in Europe and parts of Siberia. A group called the Denisovans, Denisovans, I'll say it again, that we know from a single tooth and a single finger bone, but yet very clever geneticists have managed to sequence their entire genome. And we now have several genomes also from the Neanderthals. So it's no longer just about the bones. And of course, probably the Red Deer Cave people in Southeast Asia and Homo floresiensis. And what happened at this time was it seems, for the first time ever, we interbred with the cousins. We shared our genes with them. This seems to be the first time this occurred in human evolution. And in this case, the example of the Neanderthals, it was very much a one-way affair. It was the Neanderthal males mating with our Homo sapiens females. And the DNA of evidence tells us that at the time that our kind encountered the Neanderthals for the first time, that they were probably a threatened, maybe even an endangered species. They were on the decline. They were living in small, widely dispersed groups. They, their genetic variability was very low. So maybe it was that mates were simply thin on the ground. They didn't have much choice in the case of the Neanderthal males, but to mate with this lanky, bubble-headed, Johnny-come-lately species from Africa. Maybe it was necessity. In terms of our own species, we can only wonder what th went through the minds of our Homo sapiens women. We can imagine perhaps a Paleolithic or a Stone Age Bridget Jones and the sort of <laughs> conundrum, the sort of decisions she had to face. Does she go for the cad fun-loving guy or does she go for the sensitive homemaker, bring home the woolly mammoth kind of guy? <laughs> Not quite the Bridget Jones that Hollywood had in mind, of course but a surprising and fascinating one nonetheless. And at this time, of course, it was very much a case of as our ancestors spread across the planet, keep calm, make love, not war. If you like to invoke a technical term, our ancestors seemed to have shagged their way across the old world. <laughs> Everywhere we went, we picked up genes from these other species, and those genes made their way into our very own genome. And when we look at our genome today, and of course it's been sequenced now for just over a decade, but now we have several Neanderthal genomes, Denisovan genome, we can do these remarkably fine comparisons. And it turns out for those of us uh, today alive in parts of Africa and Europe, Asia, Australia, the Americas, about 5% of our genome was inherited from Neanderthals. And for people alive today in East Asia and Australasia, Australia, another 5% was inherited from interbreeding with the Denisovans. And also some more, if you're an African, from this mystery species in Africa as well. Now, it might strike you as rather odd that species interbreed. You probably learned something very different at school about species. But it turns out that, in fact, interbreeding between species is a very important source of evolutionary novelty. It happens in bacteria, plants, and in animals. And in our own evolutionary group, the primates, which is, of course, humans, apes, monkeys, lemurs and lorises, at least 10% of species do it naturally in the wild. So you can imagine a gene that finds its way into a novel genomic background. It produces new features, novel phenotypes, novel adaptations, sometimes even new species. And so it is with our own kind, as our ancestors, another technical term, bonked their way across the old world, the Denisovans really provide for us an amazing example. Um, people living today in high altitude areas like the Himalayas probably owe the fact that they can survive at high altitude to genes that they inherited from the Denisovans. And the Denisovans seem to have given East Asians and Australians as well a bag of genes that bolstered their immune system, genes that were inherited from the Denisovans that allowed them to survive and thrive in these rather challenging environments. But there's another really rather surprising example in this story. 
And this is a gene called the microcephalin gene. This is a gene that we know in our own species is associated with the development, with the growth as children of large brains. I'm not going to pretend this is the gene for consciousness, but undoubtedly a complex biological phenomenon like human consciousness, there must be important genes like this, genes such as microcephalin, that help to determine the size of our brain. And it turns out that this gene has been under very strong selection in recent human evolution, and this is in fact a gene that we seem to have inherited from a mating with another species, probably even the Neanderthals. So the very thing that we hold most dearly, our consciousness, our, our universal self-awareness, Davies's universal self-awareness, Huxley's psychozoic, seems to be a feature that we, at least in part, acquired through interbreeding with another species. It's not something that arose on its own in our own genome. Now this is at first both very surprising, but also underscores something very important about our evolution. First, we got the gene. I was gonna say this is the ultimate irony actually, really. We got the gene, we pushed them to extinction, and we claim universal consciousness. The thing about this is what it really underscores, I guess really what one of the major take home messages from today is that there was really nothing planned about us about our evolution. Nothing built into the fabric of the universe, no design for us. That in fact, if anything, our evolution was contingent. It was accidental. A chance encounter in a dark alley. Perhaps even an evolutionary one night stand. Thank you. <laughs>